time for our next speaker here. Ivo Grigorov is, um, uh, holds a PhD in marine science. He's currently managing a portfolio of marine research projects at Denmark's National Institute of Aquatic Resources at DTU. Uh, may I give the floor to Ivo Grigorov, if you please. Great, thank you. Um, great turnout. Uh, thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Um, and uh, thank you to the previous speakers for really setting up the scenes for what I, some results I'd like to show you. Um, I'm going to refrain from commenting on uh, what the problem is and our research is it. Um, and I'm just going to um, try and throw an incentive at you or them uh, for um, open science. Um, so um, the day job, if you like, from nine to five is I work for a, a, an institute that is 70% externally funded, um, some of it public, some of it private, but it's 70% externally competitive uh, 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 funding. So that environment kind of um, um, creates a special challenges and, and kind of uh, uh, warps uh, what are incentives and, and, and what are uh, sticks and carrots. Um, and um, really that's partly uh, that's uh, setting up uh, the background and the uh, to, to this uh, little experiment uh, I'm, I'm about to show you. Um, and I'm the youngest member uh, in a team of four, and what we do is we, we will take researchers and we'll help them formulate their great ideas in a competitive way so they can bring the grant home, right? And that's kind of a, for the research, our researchers, that's kind of a, a daily rut, it's a daily headache. So um, initially we thought, well, um, this concept of openness, if we can present it as a tool that solves, uh, solves a headache. Will that, will that uh, help them uh, uh, embed it into their workflow and make it part of the way science should be done? Um, so uh, let's just uh, uh, go through a uh, quick introduction, uh, which is probably not necessary. Uh, previous speakers uh, very well set the scene here. But um, our commissioner believes that the openness is a uh, key to excellence. and. Uh, um, he's very active on social media and uh, he's also telling us it's the way science should be done in the interest of uh, reproducibility and social impact. Um, he's also saying uh, uh, that uh, uh, data, not products, is the future. And uh, um, as a colleague mentioned, that's not just uh, a few politicians' opinion locked in a room in Brussels. It's a bottom-up process that has uh, arrived here. So if that is the... Uh, background and the setup or the, 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 the political language, then what happens at grassroots uh, level? Well, uh, here is a, a, uh, um, a, a bit of a, 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 an in initiative from a speaker you will hear uh, this afternoon. But uh, he went to um, uh, our colleagues in a technical university to find out what the attitude is. And it's the opposite to the language we keep hearing. So why this attitude at grassroots level lack of incentives. So I'm not going to spend time on which incentives are the best or what is the best mix of incentives and mandates. I'm just going to focus on one incentive, uh, the one that I see on a daily basis as our researchers' headache, uh, and that's getting the resources to make their ideals true, their, their, their uh, research ideas uh, become true. So I want you to imagine, in order to do that, um, I want you to just uh, imagine the 15 or so uh, best advocates on openness, or various aspects of it, the policy, the, the infrastructure, the data, the software, the so on. You take all of them and you distill their brains into something that you can use. Uh, will that change minds at grassroots level? So that's kind of uh, what we tried to do. So uh, we took, took these great people. They, they happen to be from the Foster Project, but uh, take your 15 or 20 uh, preferred experts. It doesn't matter. And uh, th this is just some to give them some credibility. Uh, they're not just random 15 people. Uh, they, they achieved a fair amount of impact over two years uh, uh, helping implement the op uh, EC Open uh, Science uh, Agenda. And uh, you know, they, they covered a, a fair amount of the EU uh, membership. Uh, they reached out to uh, over 5,000 face-to-face uh, individuals, training them in various aspects of open science. Um, and also, um, uh, I think this is quite important, um, we managed to reach 
uh, a diversity inside the academic ecosystem. So we didn't just train the researcher because they are doing it wrong or they don't doing enough. We actually also trained the people that support the researcher. We went to the librarians, we went to the national contact points uh, in Horizon 2020. Um, uh, we, we went to the uh, people that actually uh, take care of the research uh, life cycle other than the researcher. So we, we imagine we take all of these experiences and know-how and do's and don'ts. And what we try to do is we distill them into 15 pages, something that a busy uh, grassroots researcher that's not doing everything right, uh, allegedly, um, uh, can actually digest quickly and hopefully find something that they can implement uh, to make their next grant proposal more competitive. Um, and we named it this just to catch their attention. And uh, don't worry about what it says inside. Uh, we structured it in a kind of a Q&A uh, uh, um, uh, way, um, trying to predict what is a, a busy, skeptical, and worried researcher. What, what, what questions could they come up with? And some of the questions in here are, why does open science matter? Uh, does it matter to open innovation? Uh, does it matter for economic growth? Uh, all of the difficult questions that a um, researcher is supposed to address in an average grant and struggles with. Um, and at the end of the 15 pages, we try to just produce something that is generic, telling the researcher don't copy paste, um, but adapt and make it part of your uh, research idea. Um, but it is just a suggestion of how would you deal, how would you make your complete uh, research workflow open for the benefits of uh, impact um, and uh, reproducibility and independent validation uh, and all the other uh, reasons we've been hearing uh, this morning. Now it's important to know that the central tenet to this initiative or effort um, was really to change the research uh, life cycle. Here is a caricature and the author is uh, sitting somewhere near you. Um, but what we're trying to do here is um, change the uh, average research life cycle uh, from something that is extremely focused on just one output for one measure that has its all its problems to something that is open throughout every step of the way. Um, and now they are um, in various stages of development, there are tools, philosophies, uh, and best practices that open, uh, can open the entire uh, research lifecycle. And the reason we want to do that for a single individual or a single applicant uh, going after that competitive uh, grant proposal is that it can help set them up uh, for how the research evaluation frameworks may evolve in the future, more focus on in involving the public, uh, getting societal impact, not research impact, societal impact. Um, but it, 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 today, it could actually increase uh, uh, their citation rate, and there's a number of studies on that. Uh, more importantly, it helps them deal with a problem that uh, uh, many researchers, that at least that I encounter, are not necessarily trained at dealing with. Um, so they struggle with what is societal impact? How do we get traction on it in measurable ways? Uh, but also, what are these other uh, buzzwords that come up in templates and in policy documents that an average applicant should address? What is open innovation? And, and why does my data and, and research matter to it? Um, and also this other concept of co-creation, but other buzzwords that we've heard uh, from the previous speakers uh, this morning. Um, that uh, go in engaging the public and, and creating with the public and getting citizen scientists involved in the process. So what we're arguing is that uh, if our average uh, grassroots applicant uh, uh, pays attention to us, whether they believe in it or not, they will get some of those benefits. And then we'll take that uh, and we'll take it onto a, a roadshow. So we did this over two years. Um, and again, here it's important to say uh, something that stuck uh, in my mind that um, um, uh, one of the speakers mentioned this morning, ultimately it's the researchers that can implement open science if they're supported by this ecosystem of academic stakeholders, right? The researcher can't do it alone. They need uh, uh, a variety of professionals around them that, make, that, that, that help them do their work. And so when we uh, did this training, um, uh, we had a, a catchy title that was really aiming for the applicant, but we trained the librarians on how can they support uh, the applicant. All of a sudden, we're finding that the researchers uh, stop seeing the librarian as an overhead. They, they could potentially see him 
see them as a, a, a partner in, in designing the, 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 the application. Uh, but also we train uh, the NCPs, national contact points, on how can they support the average uh, uh, applicants uh, and, and, and other professionals dealing with uh, research data management uh, and uh, research administration. Um, one particular part of the demography was uh, also the project managers. Project managers assist through project life cycle and longer. Uh, so they are also an uh, important gatekeeper to, to convince. So let's get to the point. Does all this actually make a measurable difference? Now at this point, um, I want to um, um, mention that um, the average um, evaluator uh, at, uh, uh, the, in the Horizon and FP7 program um, are instructed uh, that with respect to the open uh, uh, access, uh, open data pilot, which uh, is now a mandate, um, you are not supposed to penalize um, uh, projects that don't do it. So you, could, you might give a few nice words uh, for, for proposals that do it, but you're not supposed to penalize others. Um, but what do they say? So um, everything I'm about to show you here is kind of split into the uh, uh, three components of your average uh, proposal, and everything is extracts from uh, research evaluations uh, summaries. So what do they say? Uh, here's one uh, that we found frequently, both in excellence and uh, impact, uh, and the evaluators say, hey, say uh, this particular idea is great, but it's a little bit too focused on uh, academic activities, and it lacks an advanced communication strategy. Um, at text level, nothing to do with open science. Uh, the only problem is that uh, uh, an advanced communication uh, uh, strategy without open science, without the transparency, without the opportunity for independent validation is, is a little bit shaky. And, and, and evaluators pick up on that. Um, what else do they say? Here is a comment that comes, interestingly enough, to our surprise. Uh, it comes up bo in two sections, both in impact and in implementation. They're saying uh, data accessibility is unclear, and uh, I if somebody actually did an effort into this, try and pay a lip service in order to get that extra point, uh, but they forgot to actually put the necessary resources, the necessary infrastructure to actually make that true. Um, again, the evaluators picked up on that, and, and that was also to our surprise. Uh, it also shows you that you can't just copy-paste a paragraph into your proposal that says, I'll do open science, it will all be open, and not saying how you're going to do it. Um, it's really like uh, eating a juicy steak and you only put the pepper on one side. Uh, it's not very good. You have to really go right across. Uh, in open science needs to be part of excellence, needs to be part of the method. Uh, and then to get the credibility, you need to uh, argue what is the downstream impact, uh, uh, societal and research. Uh, and then you need to put in implementation the right resources um, and uh, the right uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, so that uh, you're really uh, uh, credible. Um, here's another comment, um, and uh, this one is uh, reaching out to yet another demography. Uh, so uh, what do they say here? Open access to scientific knowledge is an essential principle in the project. Tick. Um, but there is not enough information on data management or IPR. Again, the credibility is lacking. So uh, in this particular project, it's probably more applied, um, and uh, they are saying uh, disclosure is great, but uh, where's the limit of it? Um, and the more we are uh, into disclosure, the more we're going to uh, run into uh, conflicts or synergies uh, with, uh, uh, with IPR. Um, and uh, this has, uh, uh, again, opened an opportunity for us to work with um, uh, the IPR professionals, uh, the people responsible for patents uh, in the more applied disciplines, uh, and really work with them to uh, fine-tune where are the, the, the conflicts, if any, and are they as big as they sound, um, and where are the synergies? Um, and uh, uh, in my opinion, there are more, there are more opportunities here than, than, uh, than, uh, than conflicts. Um, I just want to focus uh, now on, uh, on impact, uh, because uh, impact is... Uh, Frequently, where uh, applicants struggle most, they, they, they don't like great ideas, they can write something excellent, uh, but framing the impact in a way that, uh, uh, that fits the language even just this morning uh, is not always obvious to the average uh, uh, excellent researcher. Um, so here are some comments from the evaluators uh, uh, to show you what they did like. Now, this is a good one because extensive dissemination of data to the scientific community is something we're supposed to be doing as researchers, right? But done well is actually appreciated. This is a positive comment. 
Um, outreach activities to a broader audience. Again, this is relevant because uh, open science in this particular uh, proposal wasn't just a, a paragraph to pay lip service. Uh, it was done with a purpose to uh, uh, inform and engage in the process. So this was attached to citizen science, uh, um, uh, which we also uh, saw this morning was one uh, important uh, issue. Uh, research software is freely available, not something that we do frequently or we don't do it well um, or we don't apply the right licenses. Uh, we don't empower the reuse of, of research software and this particular project did it well and convincing with the right infrastructure and resources and that picked up a positive point. Um, this one I'm really proud of. Uh, it says communication plan is very effective. Great. Training for communication and open access procedures I especially welcome. This uh, is a particular relevance to Marie Curie training networks. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, here, uh, this was part of the training package um, and uh, um, uh, it produced uh, uh, a positive uh, uh, outcome. Uh, my last slides uh, on impact, uh, really I'm just going to uh, go across a couple of societal challenges uh, on food security and on climate. Um, here are some examples where uh, the evaluators are saying new knowledge delivered to SMEs by depositing research outputs in uh, the relevant uh, uh, infrastructure uh, already uh, developed. Um, the key word here being outputs, they don't just care about the papers, they want the entire package of knowledge uh, available to the uh, SME community for reuse. Um, data management is based on established directives and, and, uh, and practices uh, and again that was uh, seen as, a, as, a, as an opportunity uh, for reuse uh, and wherever decision support tools were developed, uh, this is another buzzword that frequently we see in, in, in proposals, uh, then the code was available so that it can be adapted, reused and improved um, past the uh, project lifecycle. So um, that, that's really uh, uh, the essence. Um, the organizers asked for, ask for a uh, message uh, wall poll. Um, my question to this is, uh, um, in an environment uh, where um, uh, researchers are uh, being blamed and the research evaluation frameworks uh, will evolve towards something else other than just number of papers and how many times they got cited, um, my question is this, should graduate schools really teach open science alongside research excellence if open science really is the way we should be doing business. Um, but uh, personally for me, the real question is, can we afford not to? So, thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, remember to, uh, to go to the mobile wall and participate in our poll here. Are there, uh, could our mo online moderators uh, put up some instructions on how to, well, you, you probably know how to do it if you go there. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Um, mm, lunch is coming up in a while. Uh, we will also be taking uh, questions from the audience in, in just a little while, while but uh, before all that, I will give the floor to Rita Majala for some commentary. So uh, thank you very much for invitation to give this commentary and, and thank you very much for inspiring talks and presentations today. I, I especially enjoyed about the openness of discussion in open world. And uh, we heard Sastjuta Haider and Ivo Greger talking about the quality of science and how that's impacted in, in two aspects. And uh, what do we mean by quality of science? How do we produce it? And I think there are three major issues we need to have. It's really down to the competence of researcher, how they do their work. On the other hand, it's the competence of peer reviewers that actually they find out if the work was done properly by the other researchers at the end. And then, as it was mentioned already before, it's a shared activity, how whole scientific community can ensure quality of science. And this is something which I think we heard today already, and I'm sure we hear more in the afternoon, is about 
big question in future because the quality of science is something which actually influences the trust of science in societies. If you lose trust of science, uh, we lose a lot in many ways, both in science and society at large. And therefore, I think that it's very, very important we, we really consider what we are doing and why and how. On the other hand, we are living in the era of open science. The technology is here, it's here today. We can share data, methods, publications, workbooks, even the research ideas. It's all possible today. The question is how we do it. How we do it in a clever way, which enhances all the things we are looking for. At the same time, it also ensures that quality is not lost. And I think that way it also uh, it changes the scientific processes itself, and quite much we focus on that. How we build infrastructures to support open science, how we are building the new journals or opening up the traditional journals, science publications, and so on. So we are talking a lot about that. But much less is spoken about the society of change, and I really like Jutta's approach about how this changes the business model. That's a quite new approach. Uh, it's a strong statement, I would say, but that's something we should actually stop and think about. What is happening in society? When we have less resources for research in many countries, we have more researchers in the world, much more publications than before, much more data than before. How all this is going to be funded? How the competition among the scientists, but also between the nations, will actually influence how open science will turn out in the next 10 years? It has been quite idealistic in the beginning. Now it's becoming a real. But we should be very agile at Senda Vigilant that we will not make it wrong. That we actually make it something which will become better for future, better for science and better for societies. And I think the talks today pave the way what we should focus on in future also. And it all concerns us. It concerns funding instruments, it concerns how we run peer review, how we publish, how we organize data, how we train the future scientists. So I think that the time of transition is very much today here. And we should focus on the quality and ensure the trust will not be lost, but increased. At the same time, we should focus on shared activities, that nobody should work alone in open science. We should actually work together and rely on each other how we actually make it happen in here. And I very much like the Evo's proposal and explanation how you actually work together to find out what is needed for good application. That's really joint action for open science. So I, I thank for speakers and I think that actually the question is how we can find the way we want to go ahead and ensure that actually will be the better future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rita Maijala, Vice President for Research in the Academy of Finland. So, let's see what's going on up on our message wall. Our poll is, is in a quite, <laughs> well, it's not very exciting, maybe. It's, it's very unanimous, no, not a lot of dissent here, but maybe that wasn't to be expected. Should graduate schools teach open science alongside research excel excellence? 95.5%, the cake is almost entirely green. 95.5% so say yes, 0% uh, say no, and 4.4% uh, have no opinion whatsoever. So that's, that's pretty clear. Uh, we cannot afford not to, says Ina on the message board, research data has a much bigger return on invest investment than just the paper. 40 volts for yes. Okay, I think that's as clear as it can be. Thank you all, all of you for, for participating in th this poll and uh, keep your opinions and uh, questions coming. Uh, speaking of questions, we will now uh, give uh, the opportunity to, for you, for the audience to to ask questions to our experts. So, 
you know how you know what to do, you know how this goes. Just put up your hand in if you have a question, and um, and uh, tell me who you are. Uh, okay, Jean Claude Burgelman has a has a question. I think. Ah, oh, you have a comment. Well, that's fine. Thank you. So, okay, since I came so far, I speak a lot. Eh? So, <laughs> <laughs> so no, I mean, I think the. The, there are two issues I wanted to say about uh, the very valid question you raised, uh, what is the problem? I don't think we should see it as an answer to a problem, because that's not what it is. It is a, it is a system change which creates problems and opportunities, and probably more opportunities than problems. And, you know, I can, there are many, many, many examples which, which, uh, by which open science will allow us to do things we, which we were never able to do before. Let me give you Three, three examples, eh? Re reproducibility of, of, of research. Close to 60%, this is what we're, we were told, of all articles published in Nature are not reproducible, which means that there is an enormous misinvestment there from the point of view of the, of the money that was used to do that research. If you cannot reproduce this because it's all public research. So that's one thing. Another example, most of the clinical trials are not uh, are not retraceable because they're not deposited anywhere. Another example, if you want to, to, re to do a European research project on how uh, pollution, traffic pollution in cities uh, creates asthma, or, or, or is there a relationship with asthma, you need to combine health data, transport data across Europe. Impossible without open data, impossible without a trusted environment where you can do that. And then, you know, if you go to social science, which is my first degree, by the way. Uh, so so, so it, it is an enormous opportunity for social scientists, open science, because by, by having open data, by having data points on every movement, if you want, you can do things you were never able to do before as a social scientist, because you can actually track and do research in real time on social uh, uh, issues, which was simply impossible before, because you had to do it with a questionnaire or backwards and so on. Idem dito for literature, idem dito for, um, for even art history, if you want. So there are enormous opportunities there. But, but don't forget, and these are things that, that, that are happening, not as a, as a reaction to something, but as a, as a response of the modus operandi, because what is happening in open science is the same as what's happened in our economy. Do we need Amazon.com? No. Is it, is it easier to buy books? Yes. I mean, we, we lived without Amazon.com for several uh, decades, no? So, so, but it is there. So it is the same kind of logic that is happening there. And I think our, our task is to make the best out of it. There you got a, a, a very important point. And, and I think, so that's one thing. So in, with, but there still is something very important also in what you said, that it might help us to have a much more equitable science system. Uh, there is a lot of discussion in the science system now, too much peer pressure, too much uh, rat race and so on. If we, could have a much, if we could have a system whereby your research is more, is also evaluated outside the, the one article that you publish in your life in Nature or in the top journals, but that you have a much richer, and uh, the altmetrics thing, that you have a much richer um, uh, landscape of, of what you are doing because, as, as, the, as the person from Foster was uh, just saying, because at every stage of the research cycle you will have measurement and indicators and so on, you, you will probably decrease the pressure on, on, on the rat race of publications. So there are also, there I think we can solve a problem which, which, uh, which we probably didn't, didn't talk about. So in one word, it's not, it's not an answer to a problem. It is a system change. It's disruptive, winners and losers. And, and it, has, it has, of course, uh, it, it creates opportunities and, and it creates, uh, uh, most, most likely, it no, not most likely, trust. It creates a big problem, as was mentioned. Uh, uh, before, so that I think is the right way to see it, because otherwise we 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 we, we might get the debate in in, um, in 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 the wrong direction. Thank you for the comment, Jean Claude Burgelman. All right, anyone else? Sorry. Yes, please. Well, that was of course a valid comment. Um, and I, I, the question that you also should be asking about Amazon is not just do we need it and does it make, does it, do we need it and does it make our lives as buyers easier, it's also what does it feel like to work for Amazon. I hope that's also a question you would like to address. And that also for open science. But um, 
about the about the about the question that I posed. Of course, that's uh, that's a tool from social science. It's called policy analysis. It, uh, the, the 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 idea is that if you propose policies, they're underlying some sort of problem representations. You can formulate that as, as, as you want to achieve a change, and if you want to achieve a change, there's something you want to change. And of course, there are many other things in these sort of policies that you want to change that the European Commission and other bodies have uh, formulated. I just decided to focus on that because it's, I think it sticks out and it's also something that is very dangerous in sort of undermining trust in an institution that we actually absolutely rely on, especially now. Um, and also I want to comment on the, on the notion that change is not, uh, that, and all the points you made about public health and support, those are very specific uh, areas of applications of, of open science where, where opening up data is, is extremely useful and will, will change things. I wonder just if it's really that disruptive. The way you describe it is actually quite a, an evolution of, of scientific method and sort of an, 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 an improvement of, of what is possible right now with, with technical tools. And I wonder what, what, what you win actually by calling it a system change and disruption. Wouldn't it be much smarter to not frame it that way, actually? So because it does seem that if you want to disrupt something, there's something that's seriously wrong in order for you to be go in and disrupt it. So you call it a problem, you call it a system change, you call it what you want, but that's the impression you create in the documents and the policies that the European Commission produces. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jutta Heider, for, for that comment. Um, yeah, we have a question here. Yes, thanks, thanks a lot. My name is Leif Larkson, and, and I, I think it's unpolite to ask the guests to ask the question. Somebody from the local <laughs> place has to ask a question as well. So don't hide, hide Sean Claude. Uh, there is a question coming back to you with, uh, or why not everybody here? Uh, we all know that uh, there will be always bigger countries having a lot of more resources to invest in research. The, the question is, is the open science in a way enabling smaller countries opportunities which are different from the time before when we were more in the, I don't know, the analogical uh, environment? Because uh, I, what I see is that the, the big countries are still investing heavily in the infrastructure. And what I see in smaller countries is that it's declining. And uh, what's your view from the commissional post? Yes, do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah the microphone, please. Thank you. Okay, so, so that's a very good question, Leif. Thanks for that. Um, and that's not a standard answer, because I, I really think that uh, it goes back to what, what, what I said about the opportunity. So in the analog days of science, the only way to build up, this is my personal view, by the way. Huh? The, in the analog day of science, the, the only way to build up your capacity was to invest as much as another country, because that was the only way you could, you could build up your scientific excellence in, in one area. If we would have a system, Im imagine this European Open Science Cloud or whatever you want to call it, and because open is maybe not always the best word because it has connotations which, which are then attacked for reasons which are not there, but anyway. So imagine it is there. It is relatively easy for a non-big player in science to still participate in the scientific forefront because the only thing you need is bandwidth a, a computer and access to the data, but the access to the data is guaranteed because you have the open science cloud. Of course, you can only access it if you do something back. That means that you that you refit, that you re channel the results of your research into the cloud. But it seems to me that that it creates an enormous opportunity to to shortcut the the issue of widening, eh? the, the whole issue of, of disparities between excellent centers and non-excellent centers, excellent countries and non-excellent countries, big players and smaller players, because science is global. So you cannot, uh, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the key thing, eh? the, 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 the enabler is that science is, an, is, a, is a global enterprise. So we all win if, if we go for an open environment because the big players win because they get better return, the small players, they get better access. So 
I see it, but I can't prove it. It's a rhetorical, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not something we can say for the moment because it, we are not far enough in the, in the progress, but I see it as an enormous opportunity to catch up. And it's not a coincidence, for example, that in G7, G20, and, and that increasingly other regions of the world are, are looking into it because they see it as a catch up. But the key, the key thing then is what are the rules of the game? If country X, small or big, lagging behind is accessing our system, what do we get on return for that? Because it cannot be a free ticket. It cannot be, it cannot be you just access it, you pump the data, you do the research, and then you use it for your own benefit, and the system doesn't get anything back. That, that will not work. Then the big players will win in the end because they will go along anyway. So that's why I think policy is so important in, in, in this respect. Okay, we have a good debate going here. Anyone else want to comment or ask anything? We have a couple of minutes left before it's time to, to go to lunch. Uh, last chance to raise your hand. <laughs> okay, no one wants to have a go at the microphone. Uh, then I'll just uh, take a last uh, look at the message board here. Uh, the, our question of the day, should graduate schools teach open science alongside research excellence? 94% said yes, 2% <laughs> said we have dissent here now. Would it be interesting to hear, hear from <laughs> the people who said no, uh, well, why they feel this way. I mean, it's a valid opinion, of course, but, but anyone want to <laughs> comment on that? Okay, no? <laughs> Never mind, we, we can talk about it at lunch. <laughs>